So again, a couple of quick announcements today. Um, first one is I posted a couple of PDFs on DNA binding techniques on D2L with the lectures as well as mating type switching because apparently those didn't make it into the sixth edition of the textbook. So those are their PDFs, uh, take a look at them. So if any questions come up as far as that's concerned, um, take a look at those. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention on here, other than the fact I have way too many emails in my <laughs> inbox, um, has to do with one of the things we're going to be talking about today. So CRISPR-Cas technologies, cancer treatments to cancer cells using CRISPR-Cas technology. Um, there's another one in here about CRISPR-Cas, how you can write new service announcement, CRISPR-based microbial genome editing now offered in both bacteria and yeast. I get these things like every day. So um, the CRISPR-Cas story is really a huge area that's extremely active right now in terms of thinking about genome engineering. Today we'll talk about it from a gene regulatory point of view, um, from the bacterial point of view, but in the last two lectures, probably the last lecture, we'll talk about how some of this is being used now for mammalian genome engineering. The, the first clicker question was supposed to be about, let's see if I remember correctly, um, translational modifications um, and what would happen if you had a mutation in the transformer gene and in terms of the X to A ratio. So I will post that and I'll post the correct answer for that. Uh, the second one had to do with what happens if you block EIF2 interactions with the EIF2B protein and that's to do with translational initiation. So those, I really did make up questions and somehow just didn't get transferred. Must be too late at night or something like that. So hasta la vista, enjoy, have a good weekend. Um, <clears throat> so today we'll continue a little bit with post-transcriptional regulation. And again, this is really mostly about post-transcriptional initiation regulation. Should I do another clicker question? Who's still here? <laughs> I won't, don't worry. <laughs> so um, a lot of this has to do with the stability of messenger RNAs. So in bacteria, messenger RNAs are generally really not very stable, whereas in eukaryotic systems, they're very stable, and so one way of regulating the amount of final protein that you get is how much of your messenger RNA sticks around. And as we've talked about hopefully many times already, there are lots of exonucleases in the cell that love to chew in at ends. That's partly why you've got caps and tails on messenger RNAs. Um, that's why double-stranded breaks are such a problem. So um, it's really all about generating ends as far as the messenger RNA stability is concerned. And then we'll spend probably most of the time today talking about various different small RNAs and these are really the regulatory RNAs. And as I've probably said far too many times already this term, we could do a whole term on messenger RNAs and small RNAs because there are probably at least as many of these things that are expressed normally in the cell as proteins which are being expressed. So let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more alphabet soup, the MI RNAs, the SI RNAs, the RITS, the CRISPRs, and the LNC RNAs. MIRNAs are the microRNAs. These are the endogenous RNAs, and these are really made to do regulation. We'll talk about how those work. SIRNAs seems to be more of a protective mechanism and was originally found in looking at protection from virus infection. Um, and this is a much more specific process. There's RNA-induced transcriptional silencing, and we'll talk about that again much more. That's what the RITS is. Mechanisms for making the RNAs are very similar, but what happens is really quite different. CRISPRs, again, another horrible acronym. I won't ask you to remember it, but it took me years to remember that it's clusters of regularly interspersed palindromic repeats. Um, and then long non-coding RNAs. And if we get to, we'll talk about methods, but if not, we'll end up talking about those next week, the last couple of lectures. So, yeah, 
So the question here has to do with the role of RNA in transcriptional initiation. And curiously enough, there's not very much of that, um, as far as we can tell. Not very many um, RNAs that are involved directly in transcriptional initiation, with the exception of a few, and we'll talk about them when we talk about our long non-coding RNAs, um, having to do with bringing all the appropriate components to the transcriptional start site. So, but for the most part, strangely actually, um, RNAs don't seem to be very involved in that first process, the original transcription process. But if you think about it, the RNAs, of course, have to be transcribed from the DNA, and so you'd be making an RNA to regulate making an RNA. So, but certainly, there's no particular reason why there shouldn't be regulation that way, and there are a few cases where that's actually the case, but relatively few and far between, interestingly enough. Okay, so translational regulation. Last time we talked about the global translational regulation, which is EF2, that clicker question that I didn't have. Mea maxima culpa. Uh, but that's regulating translational initiation at the level of the initiation factor. The initiation factor two, which is bringing in the initiator tRNA. Here, this is looking at translational regulation on specific RNAs. So, couple of different ways that this can be done, and these are again just some examples of how we can get translational regulation having to do with concentrations of these initiation factors. If you have really low concentrations of EIF4F, what's um, EIF4F? 4E and 4G together, the really funky nomenclature. Um, so those cap binding and bridging proteins, um, if you have very high concentrations of that, you very often, the ribosome will very often use the very first AUG, but if low concentrations, it turns out it can scan in a leaky process, because you remember the small segment of the ribosome actually comes down and interacts with the cap binding complex and then scoots along the RNA until it gets to an AUG. At low EIF4F, you can go to a secondary AUG. And so this gets back to some of the questions that people were asking me last time, I think, where how can you have polycystronic transcripts in eukaryotes? So multiple different proteins that are being made in eukaryotic messenger RNAs. They're few and far between, but some of them exist. And this is one of those cases where you've got multiple different reading frames being made on one particular messenger RNA. The other kind of polycystronic messenger RNAs are these so-called upstream open reading frames. So ORF is just open reading frame. And basically, this is as a start codon. It's got some normal coding sequence, a stop codon. And what happens is <clears throat> if you have a messenger RNA that's got lots of these little short open reading frames that usually don't code for proteins that are going to make anything, the ribosome just sits on these and doesn't get to the main open reading frame, which is usually further downstream on the messenger RNA. So it's a way to basically slow down translation. And particularly, this is going to be in the case of low EIF2, because EIF2 has to bring in the initiator tRNA in order to get everything started. So these are a couple of ways that just by the sequence of your messenger RNA, and again, in a few cases in eukaryotes, you have these polycystronic uh, messenger RNAs. Mm -hmm. it, so that one slows translation as well? So the low EIF4, um, that doesn't seem to slow things as much as just change which of the AUGs get used. So it allows for multiple proteins to be made from one. Yeah, so, so using different AUGs can allow for completely different proteins to be made because, of course, your reading frame is three different places. So if you start at nucleotide one, two, or three, it's going to make a difference in terms of what code you're going to end up with your protein. Yeah? So I'll pick off from that. So what actually causes the uh, translation to slow down is that, I guess we're calling it sequestering of ribosome, where it just kind of, quote, unquote, sits on those short, short open reading frames. That's what actually slows it down. Yeah, so the, the process of translation is being slowed down because 
you've got all these ribosomes sitting on open reading frames trying to translate, but you have low EIF2, so you can't be bringing in the initiator tRNA. So this is a very similar to that general case that we talked about last time with phosphorylation of EIF2. Um, that blocks everything. Here it's just blocking those specific open reading frames that have a lot of these extra open reading frames with them, or upstream ORFs, as people call them. Okay, so there's a <clears throat> another process having to do with translational initiation that was originally found in viruses because they're, of course, the coolest thing ever. Uh, but <clears throat> this is something called the internal ribosome entry site. So this is how things normally are working again. You've got EIF4F, which is E plus G, binding to the cap and then bridging over to your poly A tail. Irises, being an internal ribosome entry site means it doesn't start at the beginning, it starts somewhere in the middle. This is a secondary structure which forms in your RNA that allows the ribosome to start other than at the very 5' prime end and scanning along the RNA. And so this is a way that you can deal with, which we'll talk about a bunch in virology next term, of how this process and why this process is really useful to have. Um, but it turns out that this is also a way you can have a polycystronic open reading, oh, sorry, polycystronic mRNA. If you've got one of these internal ribosome entry sites, this could be your ribosome to come into the middle of a messenger RNA as opposed to at one end. Um, all of these irises are cap independent, so you don't have to have a capped messenger RNA, but they do require some of these initiation factors. So that's this, you know, cap but not factor independent process. There are multiple different kinds of irises. We won't talk about them now, but it basically has to do with which of these initiation factors they require or not. So that's all about getting translational initiation. Another big way that translation is regulated in eukaryotic cells has to do with the stability of your messenger RNA. And again, this is all about nasty exonucleases that just love to chew in at the ends of nucleic acid. Bacteria, most messenger RNAs are actually pretty unstable. They don't last for very long. And that's probably because they don't have caps at the end, so they get chewed in on. But also because in bacteria, you've got transcription and translation happening at the same time. So it's not as critical that you have the messenger RNA be stable as you do in eukaryotic cells, which you've got to get that RNA out of the cytoplasm and then find an appropriate ribosome. Uh, so it turns out that, again, mostly unstable in bacteria. In eukaryotes, they can be relatively unstable, half an hour they'll last, or tens of hours. So multiple different kinds of things. And just in general, what happens with these <clears throat> messenger RNAs in eukaryotes, again, they've got caps and tails, uh, you can have normal and this is, these would be your long-term, long-lasting messenger RNAs, where the poly A tail actually gets chewed in. And this is because we have three prime exonucleases that are going to chew in at the end of your messenger RNA. Yes, you've got the poly A binding protein bound to the end here, but it's still not going to protect against those really hungry exonucleases. So it, these will get chewed in to a certain point. After they get to about 30 adenines in your poly A tail, then there's no longer binding of the poly A binding protein. You no longer have the loop structure which forms in most of your eukaryotic messenger RNAs. And now the cap gets taken off and you have really rapid degradation of the rest of your messenger RNA. So this is a sort of a timing. The longer the poly A tail you have, the longer your messenger RNA is going to be kept inside the cell. On the other hand, a lot of these short-lived messenger RNAs have specific endonuclease sites in very often the three prime untranslated region. Again, this is after the protein coding sequence. As soon as you have endonucleolytic cleavage, and again, endonuclease is just cut inside of nucleic acids, not at either end, that no longer has a nice circular RNA the five prime end gets chopped off and you have very rapid degradation. So particularly very short-lived RNAs, they're going to be 
those that have these endonuclease sites. And these can also be regulated, of course, in particularly different cell types. So if you happen to have a cell type that has this endonuclease, then that messenger RNA will be very short-lived in those cell types. But if you have a different cell that doesn't have this endonuclease, it's probably going to be a much longer-lived one. And the way that this works is basically here, as soon as you have gotten rid of poly-A binding proteins, deadenylases will chew in at your poly-A tail. You have a decapping enzyme. This gets broken down really quite rapidly. Yeah? So what about exonucleases? Do you not get to their protocol at this point? Is it like this endonuclease that has that ability to degrade an RNA throughout the system? So the exonucleases are the ones which are chewing up the messenger RNA, chewing in from the ends. It's the endonuclease that provides that starting position to do that. So if you're nice and circular like you have here, nice cap, nice cap binding protein, nice poly A tail, a bunch of poly A binding proteins bound to that, that's pretty well protected from the hungry exonucleases, which would just love to chew up your RNAs. Uh, but as soon as these are removed, then the exonucleases are going to chew things up really, really rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is that endonuclease cleavage site kind of a regulatory process? And exactly true, yes. And so those are, it's a regulation, regulation of that messenger RNA to make sure that whenever that endonuclease is around, that particular messenger RNA is only around for a short period of time. Why would you want to have that? You wouldn't want to have very much protein. So if you're chopping up that messenger RNA, it can't be translated, and so you're going to end up with a relatively small amount of protein. So this would be a way to regulate protein levels so you don't have too much of it being built up at some point. Okay, so that's um, messenger RNA stability. Uh, we also have a couple of examples of proteins which will stabilize specific RNAs, and this is a really <clears throat> fun example well, for me anyway, you may not think it's so much fun. Uh, but iron regulation inside of cells. So there's a <clears throat> particular protein called the aconitase, which binds to iron and also regulates two different iron regulatory proteins. Now, iron we need at small amounts inside our cells for all kinds of different things. But if you have too much iron, you end up with all kinds of nasty reactions that will break down DNA, cause active oxygen species, et cetera. So regulating the amount of iron inside the cell is very, very important. So how that works is you have ferritin messenger RNA. And ferritin messenger RNA, ferritin makes this structure which will basically bind iron and keep it away from all the things that it shouldn't be interacting with inside the cell. So if you have too much iron, you want to have ferritin. On the other hand, if you don't have enough iron, which you need for some of the cofactors, for some of your enzymes, et cetera, then you want to have a way of bringing iron inside the cell. And that's transferrin, particularly the transferrin receptor. So transferrin is a protein that binds to iron. And then that gets brought inside the cell if you don't have too much iron. And the way this is regulated is actually a lot like what happens in bacterial transcriptional regulators. So you have interaction of iron with the aconitase. And the aconitase will bind to RNA. But it binds to RNA only in the absence of iron. And in the case of the ferritin messenger RNA, it binds at the 5' UTR and blocks translation. In <clears throat> the transferrin receptor messenger RNA, it binds to the 3' end and allows translation to take place. However, if it's not bound, this messenger RNA gets degraded really rapidly. And so instead of being protected now by the poly A tail and the poly A binding protein, this is, messenger RNA is actually protected by this specific RNA binding protein is associated with the <clears throat> three prime end. And so hopefully this is sort of a recurring theme, talking about stability of messenger RNAs, eukaryotic messenger RNAs. It's almost always the three prime end. 
which is where all of this activity is happening. So protecting that 3 prime end from getting degraded because you've got polybinding protein, et cetera. If you've got endonuclease, it's cutting at the 3 prime end here. The aconitase is binding and protecting the 3 prime end. So it seems to be really the 3 prime end which is most important in terms of the stability of your, your messenger RNA. So any questions on the translational regulation with the individual RNAs? Now we'll talk about some of the small RNAs. So there really are you know, lots and lots of different small RNAs, but we'll talk about three different kinds of small regulatory RNAs <coughs> for um, the basically probably most of the rest of today. Uh, these are small RNAs. All of them are made from double-stranded RNA, and we'll see how you get that double-stranded RNA in just a second. It varies depending on which kind of small RNA you're making. That double-stranded RNA gets chopped up and pulled apart and you have a, one short RNA that interacts with one of these proteins. And these are the argonaut proteins or PB proteins. And there's the different ones for the different processes. So we'll talk about those in a little bit more um, detail. This short RNA now is going to interact with some kind of target RNA. And surprise, surprise, how do they interact with each other? Through base pairing interactions. So the specificity for this regulatory RNA is going to be dependent on base pairing interactions that happen with this target RNA. And again, this is the very general sense. We'll talk about each of these separate things in just a second. Probably the most important endogenous process, i.e. one which is where the cell makes these things on purpose, has to do with translational repression. So it's shutting down translation, and this is the MI RNA step. You can also have cleavage of the target RNA. This is an endonucleolytic cleavage, which happens. And this is particularly in these small interfering RNAs. And then in a few cases, and this is the cases with the peewee proteins, you can form heterochromatin and shut down transcription. And so this is getting back to your question about how some small RNAs are important for transcriptional initiation regulation. It's very indirect because it mostly has to do with heterochromatin rather than a direct effect on any particular promoter. So let's <clears throat> look at the first of these. These are the microRNAs or miRNAs. These microRNAs are made from very specific genes. They're made by, for the most part, RNA polymerase II. They get capped. They get tailed. Usually they're pretty short, only hundred or so nucleotides in length. Um, many of them are between 100 and 200 nucleotides. So what happens is after these RNAs are made, regular transcript, regular genes, so those are those maybe almost 20,000 non-protein coding genes that are in the genome, these will then get cut by specific endonucleases inside the nucleus and this process, in fact, there are multiple different endonucleases, they will recognize this double-stranded piece of RNA, because remember, all of these things have to happen from double-stranded pieces of RNA, but this particular double-stranded piece of RNA is double-stranded on itself. It's not two different pieces of RNA that come together. This one's double-stranded on itself, forming this hairpin loop structure. It gets chomped a little bit inside the nucleus, gets exported, and then the famous process here is called the dicer protein. Um, the dicer chops up the RNA into short lengths. These are usually now 20 to 30 nucleotides. So we had about 100 and, between 100 and 200 up here. Gets chopped down to a double-stranded piece of RNA. Again, about 20 nucleotides long. That then associates with these proteins. And it's this single-stranded RNA now that can bind to messenger RNAs and basically has two kinds of activities that happen here. The main one is probably here. When you don't have too many matching sequences here that you had from way back here, your original microRNA, matches usually at, again, the 3' prime UTR of your messenger RNA and leads to translational reduction. So again, it's 3' prime end, how can 3' end leading to reduction in translation? That's because 3' ends and 5' ends are really 
very close to each other with these looped structures. So this is probably the classic mechanism where your microRNA doesn't match the messenger RNA very much. It's usually five or six nucleotides. That will lead to translational reduction. So you can have one microRNA, again here, about 100 nucleotides, but it's only going to be here five or six nucleotides here that will match with 3' UTRs. So that means that one microRNA can actually regulate lots and lots of different genes. And the best understood examples, they are literally hundreds of different genes that are regulated by one single microRNA. The other process which can happen is if you have a whole bunch of matches in your messenger RNA to your microRNA. This is pretty rare, but it does happen occasionally. You have, of the 20-odd nucleotides that you have in this particular small RNA, probably 18 to 20 of them are perfect matches. If you have a perfect match, then you have the slicer, so we're slicing and dicing here, um, slicer which will chop your messenger RNA in the middle. As soon as your messenger RNA is chopped in the middle, what happens? All the hungry exonucleases are there, and they'll chew up the rest of your messenger RNA. So it's that key first cleavage step which happens. So this is not like we saw with the regulated messenger RNAs that have an endonuclease, which is going to cut specifically just protein. Now we have an endonuclease which is being guided by the microRNA because of the base pairing interactions and causing the cleavage to happen in that one particular place. One of the things mentioned here at the bottom, um, very often when you have this base pairing, the minor base pairing, translational shutdown, these messenger RNAs get moved to particular places inside the cell that we'll take a look at in just a second. They're called the processing bodies. Um, the other process, which is actually very similar to what's happening here when you have multiple matches that happen between messenger RNAs and your microRNAs, happen here. And this happens pretty generally with double-stranded RNA. And everyone taking virology next term is going to hear all about double-stranded RNA. Even single-stranded RNA viruses make double-stranded RNA at some point. And generally, double-stranded RNA is an indication that something's wrong in your cytoplasm and usually be some kind of virus infection because there's very little double-stranded RNA present in the cytoplasm, certainly not that are long stretches of double-stranded RNA. You'll have short ones, the sort of hairpin loop structures, but nothing that's hundreds and in some cases thousands of nucleotides long. So the cellular machinery, and particularly the dicer protein, will recognize these long double-stranded RNAs, chop them into about 20 to 30 nucleotides in length, put them onto the same proteins, actually, that are being used in microRNAs. But these guys now are going to match whatever double-stranded RNA came in. So if it's the virus genome, it's going to get chewed up by a perfect match now, because it's just one of these strands that came from this double-stranded RNA in the first place. This is now going to get chewed up and the cell doesn't have to worry about that particular virus anymore. It's a really nice antiviral process. Turns out it's also really good at regulating the activity of transposons. Why transposons? Well, if you think about our genome and most mammalian genomes, they've got huge numbers of transposons in them. Those transposons are identical sequences to each other because they've jumped and hopped and gone somewhere else in the genome. So we talked about from way back when, from deep, dark history of this term. You have some transcription that happens on both strands of your DNA all the time. If you've got highly repeated sequences like transposons, and you're transcribing them on both strands, you're going to end up with double-stranded RNA, which is matching a bunch of your repeated sequences that you have present in the genome. And so whenever any of those transposons get expressed, and are trying to jump their particular gene somewhere else inside the cell, very often there's going to be double-stranded RNA that's going to match that particular messenger RNA that's going to try and make the transposase to make the gene jump. And so it gets broken down. It gets chopped up. So the transposons are the messenger RNA for the transposon. Before the transposon can jump at all, 
gets degraded. Another thing that happens with these double-stranded RNAs is they associate with these Ritz proteins, which is, what does that stand for again? RNA-induced transcription silencing. So <clears throat> here we have, again, double-stranded RNA that forms. This double-stranded RNA forms on the newly made messenger RNA from RNA polymerases and gives you histone methylation, DNA methylation, and what do those lead to? Translational repression, uh, sorry, transcriptional repression. Mentioned P bodies already. Um, these are areas in the cell. They're not in the nucleus. This is all in the cytoplasm where the messenger RNAs that have bound to microRNAs basically get sent. Uh, and this is, you can see them. If you look, this particular case is looking at some of the proteins, like the argonaut protein, which you label with a fluorescent antibody. They localize to very specific places inside the cell. And interestingly enough, when you stress a cell, um, they also form these areas inside the cell where lots of RNAs are. So these are our either processing bodies, stress granules. Um, these messenger RNAs are, again, complexed with small RNAs, other proteins, and <clears throat> one other thing that seems to happen with these P bodies is a way of protecting your messenger RNAs from the nasty exonucleases. And so it seems that exonucleases can't degrade your messenger RNA when it's one of these P bodies, can't degrade the messenger RNA when it's in one of these stress granules. It's still not completely understood how this process takes place, how you get your messenger RNAs and P bodies how they go from P-bodies to stress granules as well. How do you tell the difference between a stress granule and a P-body? It's the presence of some of these extra proteins. Uh, but they're very, I think, uh, transient. They'll come and go inside the cell. They're not always in the same place. They're not a nice membrane-browned organelle. They're where you have all of these proteins that are bound to each other. And again, way, way back when, right in the beginning of the class, we were talking about unstructured proteins. So proteins that are intrinsically unstructured, really floppy, like some of the amyloid proteins that we don't like when they form nasty plaques and misfold. But in some cases, they have unstructured regions which are really good at binding to lots of different RNAs. And so it turns out that a lot of the normal amyloid proteins are actually present in these P-bodies and stress granules, probably helping to protect the messenger RNAs which are there. So we talked about this RNA-induced transcription silencing. Just wanted to mention it again here um, through this process. So that's all that's happening in eukaryotic cells. P-bodies, siRNA, miRNA, RNA-induced transcription silencing. There's also something that happens in bacteria having to do with regulation. This is, again, the so-called CRISPRs, the clusters of regularly interspersed palindromic repeats. No, I won't ask you that on the exam because CRISPR is a heck of a lot easier to think about. But what these are, these are particular sequences that were found originally in E. coli, strangely enough, um, by <coughs> a fellow by the name of Yoshi Ishum, uh, uh, Ishino, who's in Kyushu in Japan, who now works on much more interesting things like archaea. But he found these in bacteria in the first place, and he thought, this is really bizarre, because there's this whole part of the genome that has these inverted repeats, or palindromic repeats, it means it you know, reads the same on one strand as it does on the other strand, that are separated from each other by anywhere between 40 or 50 nucleotides. And so <clears throat> the repeats are shown here in orange, and then these interspersed regions were just random sequences. No one really knew what they were. Until probably about 15 years ago now, somebody noticed that some of these spacer sequences actually matched viral sequences. But they're short. They're only, you know, again, 50 nucleotides or so, in some cases even shorter than that. So there's DNA sequences that match the sequences of viruses. 
And so people are going, hmm, what does this mean? Well, maybe, just maybe, this is something kind of like RNA interference. So you've got an RNA that then gets made from this particular region of the genome, and that RNA could match a DNA that comes inside from an infecting DNA virus, and then if you have something like the argonaut or slicer proteins, it can chop up that DNA. And this was a really fascinating observation. In fact, some of the very first people to notice it were Eugene Koonin um, and his group uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. Um, they made a prediction that these sequences were actually being used for protection against virus infection. About a year later, so nine years ago, um, people actually showed that that was the case, and so that's basically what you can see here. So you have a DNA virus that infects a poor bacterium, and if that bacterium survives, it will chop up the viral DNA into little pieces. Again, these are 20 to 30 nucleotides in many cases, some as much as 50, and then through this mechanism that's just slowly beginning to be understood, will take this DNA and put it into its own genome. Once that DNA is in the genome, it basically provides some memory of what kinds of viruses have infected that cell in the first place. So it's kind of like a immunology for bacteria, which is really kind of fascinating. Nobody thought this existed, and again, literally in the last 10 years we found out about this. So <clears throat> you now have a history of all of the different kinds of viruses that had infected this cell, but much more importantly, all of the ancestors of this cell, because it's DNA. So it gets copied and passed along to the next generation. So these sequences are sort of the cellular memory of previous infections. So what happens is if you have memory of one of these previous infections, say here there was a DNA virus that had this red sequence, cell didn't die from it, incorporated a small piece into its genome. Now what happens is these are transcribed into RNAs, and these short RNAs, not unlike the case that's happening with Argonaut and all these Ritz proteins, now have a short RNA that can bind to and now cleave DNA for a new virus infection. So the fact that this guy was infected way back here by a DNA virus, or the ancestors of this particular cell were infected, now it's protected against this infection because it chews up the DNA. Really cool process, and it turns out people have now figured out how to use this to do genome editing in eukaryotic cells and even in human cells, and we'll talk about that Next week, um, there's also huge patent arguments that are going on as far as this is concerned. <clears throat> so the last thing I want to talk about in terms of RNAs for regulatory purposes is the long non-coding RNAs. There are thousands of these things. We know what very, very few of them do. We've already talked about one long non-coding RNA, Xint, exactly, so for X inactivation. These are <clears throat> just examples of some other long non-coding RNAs. Mostly what seems to happen with these long non-coding RNAs is that they will make secondary structures. Those secondary structures will interact with proteins, and those proteins are then important for some kind of activity. So the proteins here that are being brought together by that RNA this is what's called a scaffolding process. So the scaffold is literally the RNA. And since different proteins bind to that RNA, basically the RNA brings those different proteins together. So in <clears throat> this case, these proteins that it's being brought together, many of them turn out to be histone acetyl transferases. There'll be other chromatin modifying enzymes that then will either interact with this long non-coding RNA that's right next to the genes it's regulating, or in some cases the long non-coding RNA will regulate genes that are present in other parts of your chromosome. So the long non-coding RNA, again, is being made by your RNA polymerase. Uh, 
it could have function while it's being made, but that long non-coding RNA could diffuse through the cell, and particularly here in the nucleus, and act in a transformation, just again, because it brought these proteins to a particular part of the genome. How does that work? Well, it's because of the wonderful thing that RNA does, which is base pair. So all these base pairing interactions then can lead to bringing these proteins that are bound to the RNA to a specific either RNA or, in some cases, DNAs. Again, this is a sort of brave new world of understanding regulation that's going on in genomes is trying to understand what a lot of these long non-coding RNAs are doing. And again, there are many, many, many of them. There are just three or four cases that we have a good handle on what exactly they're doing. So that brings us to the end of gene expression. We started out this section of the course after the last midterm, so what you're going to be studying for the final, um, out here with Initiation of transcription control. So all of our DNA binding proteins, all of the repressors, the activators, etc. Talked a little bit about RNA processing control. I guess it was like third lecture in this section or so. Um, capping, splicing, tailing. And today we mostly talked about degradation of messenger RNA and how translation has been controlled. Control of protein activity, that's for cell biology next term, or whenever you've taken cell biology, as the case may be. So this, I think, is a really good framework to think about studying for the final. Um, thinking about all of these different processes, the different proteins that are involved in any of these particular steps. So any questions about this before we move on and talk about methods? Okay, so most of the methods here, we're talking about proteins <clears throat> and <clears throat> practically everything that we've talked about in this class depends on these methods. And sometimes I've actually thought about doing this whole section before I do anything else for the rest of the class because pretty much everything depends on this. So the way our textbook is set up, this is now chapter eight of, and we're not gonna talk about everything in chapter eight by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we're just going to cover a couple of highlights um, having to do with protein and DNA methods here. So <clears throat> basic concepts in terms of proteins, it's all about separating individual proteins from all of the other proteins that you have inside the cell. And when the main mechanisms is centrifugation, so taking what you get out of the cell, breaking it into its individual components, and then trying to separate them from each other just based on how rapidly these particular proteins will be centrifuged, be passing through either a gradient or a non-gradient, um, looking at separation. Chromatography, we talked about chromatography a little bit when we talked about affinity chromatography before. Basically, this is differential binding of for proteins to individual beads. And so we talked about the beads which are bound to a specific DNA sequence for affinity chromatography. Here there are lots of other ways that you can separate proteins based on their size, based on their charge, based on their hydrophobicity. A lot of what people do these days in terms of protein purification is they put a little tag at the end of your protein. It makes life a lot easier in terms of purifying your proteins if you've got some little piece at the end of your protein which binds to a very specific kind of bead. In fact, almost all protein purification these days um, has to do with these tags. Talk a little bit about how you separate proteins. This is sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Everyone talks about SDS page. Um, but we'll talk about that process and probably not going to get to mass spec or some of the structural methods today. So what about these protein methods? Centrifugation, there are basically three kinds of centrifugation that we're going to talk about. Either preparative centrifugation, which is just like it sounds, making stuff using the centrifuge. And then sedimentation and equilibrium centrifugation are really analytical tools for the most part in terms of 
deciding what proteins you have, what kind of particular properties they have. Um, equilibrium centrifugation, we talked about, again, way back when, when we talked about DNA replication. Measles and stall was all about equilibrium centrifugation, separating things based on density. So old DNA, new DNA. Chromatography, again, it's all about the surface of your protein and how the surface of your protein is different from all the other proteins, because that's what you're trying to do here. You're trying to separate your favorite protein, and I'll talk about YFP all the time here, because your favorite protein, um, from all the other ones. Ion exchange, in terms of the charges on the outside of your protein, gel filtration or size exclusion, just how big your particular protein happens to be, and affinity, what does it bind to? And this is really all about tags um, very much these days. Again, we'll talk a little bit about electrophoresis. Um, STS page, separating proteins relative to each other based on their molecular mass. And then we looked a little bit at two-dimensional gels before. The 2D gel is separating with STS page, but also separating based on the so-called isoelectric point, which is also dependent on the charge of your protein. And we'll talk mostly about mass spec and all these other things a little bit later on. So first process, and this is um, a pretty gross process, i.e. it's something that you do very early on when you're trying to purify your favorite protein from all the other proteins that are present in a piece of tissue, they're present in a cell, they're present in your culture, you're present in your bacteria. Uh, very much the first thing you do is you break the cell into all of its components. Someone was asking me about cell extracts the other day. Uh, so basically, it's all about breaking open the cell, separating those things from the membranes, everything that's holding them all together, so that you can separate the proteins out from that. So when you've broken apart your cell, and this you can use some kind of enzyme, you can use sonication, you can use chemicals, lots of different ways to break open cells, or even if you have tissue just crushing it in a homogenizer, um, mortar and pestle is another way of doing this. So if you do first a low speed centrifugation, that will separate your proteins away from all the other junk that you don't want. So cells that haven't been broken, nuclei, cytoskeletons, etc. This is just the really slimy, gross, nasty stuff, um, particularly the <clears throat> lipids, etc., that are still left in your, your preparation. You want these proteins, and part of the reason you want to get these proteins separated from this other stuff is that if you were to just put this straight onto a column to your column chromatography, it's all going to get gunked up. It's going to be really nasty and messy. So um, very much the first thing you'll do after you've broken open your cells is do a low speed spin to get rid of unbroken cells, separate these guys out. Then you can basically crank up your centrifuge to a higher speed after you've gotten rid of this stuff down at the bottom here. And now this can separate mitochondria, lysosomes, peroxisomes. If you happen to be interested in these things, which are really cool and fascinating, et cetera, then you can also take what's down here at the bottom. This is what's called the pellet. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we're interested in what's present in the supernatant. And then this now we can use for our chromatography process or for some of the analytical tools. And that brings us to analytical centrifugation. This is either called, let me just get rid of this, uh, sedimentation velocity or equilibrium centrifugation. So this side is our sedimentation velocity. This side is our equilibrium centrifugation. Sedimentation velocity is pretty straightforward. You put your sample at the top of your centrifuge tube. You start your centrifuge spinning. Leave it for a certain period of time. And then you make a hole in the bottom of your tube. And you collect what's in the bottom of the tube. That's going to be over here. A little bit further down is going to be here. Then eventually, as everything's flowing out the bottom here, you're going to end up with this fraction, which is your fast sedimenting component. Keep going. You've got all of this stuff in between. Eventually, you'll get to this point and then finally get to the top of your tube. You remember all that funky nomenclature they had for ribosomal RNAs, for ribosomal subunits? 18S, 16S, 30S, 70S, that all comes from these kinds of experiments.
So fast sedimenting, these are going to have the smaller S numbers. So 16S would be here, 30S would be here. So it's a way of characterizing these particular um, products here. So it's just separation based on size, this sedimentation um, velocity experiment. On the other hand, if you really want to separate things that are much more similar to each other, so 16S, 18S, there are thousands of nucleotides different in terms of their length, and the small subunit and the large subunit of the ribosome are really different in terms of their size. If you want to separate something that's very similar, then you need to do a different kind of experiment, which is an equilibrium centrifugation experiment. And this was really developed by people like Matt Mieselson to do the experiments that they did with the most beautiful experiment in biology. It's shifting from heavy nucleotides to light nucleotides and separating them from each other. So what happens here is you have <clears throat> a gradient which you form in your centrifuge tube. You can either make the gradient beforehand with cesium chloride or some other very dense kind of solution. And then you mix your sample with that all the way through this gradient. What happens is if you spin this now for a very long time, what will happen is you'll set up a gradient. It's supposed to be from dark blue down here at the bottom to light blue up at the top. It's a little hard to see. But basically, this is your really dense. This is your less dense. And then what will happen as you're spinning, these things are going to come to an equilibrium where the high density component will be down towards the bottom. The low density component will be a little bit further towards the top. And you can literally separate these two things from each other. You can actually see them as they did in the measles and stall experiment where they had the heavy DNA versus the light DNA. This is exactly how they did that. Um, these kinds of spins are usually between 50 and 100,000 times gravity um, for 18 hours, 30 hours, something like that. So they're very long processes. Um, that you need. Um, so, let's process. Okay, let me go back and see if we can rescue this image here because it doesn't like me. Um, I will have a new computer next term, so virology, this should never happen again. So, um, hopefully some of you have um, this image here, non-existent. Um, we'll go through the individual ones in just a second here, but the idea here is that now you've gotten your supernatant after you've broken your cells, you've spun everything down. It's still a whole mixture of different proteins. And so what you want to do, and this is the chromatography, the picture here actually has different colors that are being separated here um, in your column. You put these at the top of your column, which is basically a glass tube that has some kind of matrix in the middle of it. And that matrix will slow down some of the proteins as they're going through this particular column. And if this is a direct interaction, a strong interaction between the two, then these things are going to go slowly. And I forget, is that the red line? I forget if it's the red line or whichever one stays up at the top. So it gets, it gets yeah, the green gets held up more than any of the other things. And so that process, basically, you put things on at the top, you let them flow through, the interactions with the matrix are going to slow down some of your mixture. In this case, it's the different colors, the colored bands, but usually going to be your protein. And then they'll come off at the bottom. And just as they come off at the bottom, you collect the first things that come off, the second things that come off, the third things that come off. So once you've done these, you have all of these tubes that have different colored things in them. If you're really, really lucky, usually they don't have different colored things in them. And so then you'll do some kind of assay, like our electrophoretic mobility shift assay that we talked about in lecture. And I did put the PDF that discusses that um, online on, on D2L. So what are these matrices? Um, basically, they take advantage of whatever different kind of thing your protein has on the outside. Ion exchange is taking advantage of the charge which is on the outside of your protein. Hydrophobic interaction is going to take advantage of what hydrophobic side chains are exposed in your protein. Gel filtration is just the size of the protein 
and affinity is what that protein is going to bind to. So let's take a look at some of these. Yay, I've actually got the figure back now. So ion exchange is this example right here. In this particular case, you have positively charged, your beads, but that's your matrix. That's what's in the column. So if you have something which is negatively charged, it's going to interact with these beads. It's going to slow down anything that's negatively charged relative to anything which is positively charged. And it's also going to be dependent on exactly how much charge your protein is. So here, <clears throat> what you do is you put in that mixture of proteins. They will, if they're negatively charged, bind to or get slowed down by this matrix. And then what you do is just increase the salt concentration. And as you increase the salt concentration, you will exchange the ions. One of the ions is your protein. The other ion now is the salt, which you've added to this column. And that will give you different fractions, as long as you're collecting them across the bottom, say one mil each. Each time you raise the salt concentration a little bit, you'll collect something. That'll be proteins that have a certain charge, et cetera. And so you can separate proteins based on their external charge using ion exchange, and this is just my shorthand for this, IEX, ion exchange chromatography. Gel filtration chromatography is also known as size exclusion chromatography. That's shown over here on the right-hand side. Here you have a matrix that has holes in it, and those holes are going to slow down the elution of smaller things more than they slow down the elution of bigger things. Yeah? Oh, so here, um, elution is what's coming off the bottom of your column. So you'll bind something to the column and you will elute it from the column. So this is the binding elution. You know, put on, which is binding, elution coming off. And this is usually done, you know, again, through your salt concentration here. With your size exclusion, this is put things on at the top, or they will come off the bottom. There's no actual reversible kind of direct interaction here. So you don't have to change the conditions at all. You just let this go. And it has to do with, again, the size of the holes that you have in your beads. And the smaller stuff takes longer to go through than the bigger stuff does. Uh, this is a what's called the relatively low resolution technique. We'll see that the last slide that hopefully we'll get to today. Uh, this has a really big advantage over all of the other kinds of chromatography is that because it's actually not binding, you don't have to change the conditions in order to get it to come off the column. So it's a very gentle technique. Um, and it's often used to have whatever solution you put your sample on in the first place and exchange that with a different solution. Because if you think about what's your solutes in some kind of buffer solution, you may have a bunch of salt in your buffer solution. Say maybe you have a fraction that you got from your ion exchange chromatography, you put it on your gel filtration chromatography. Salts, of course, are really small. And so it's going to take them a really long time to go through this, this column, whereas the big stuff um, will be towards the bottom. So you can take your proteins and move them from one buffer to a different um, buffer. These two processes usually give you about 20-fold concentration. And so when I say 20-fold um, purification or 20-fold concentration here, you've gone from one part in 2,000 to one part in 100 is the protein that you're looking for. Uh, this is OK if you're looking at very abundant proteins, but usually this is not going to be enough, particularly if you're looking for things like enhancer binding proteins that, as we mentioned way back when, are present at very low concentrations inside the cell. This process is not enough to get the full purification there. Was there a question? So here, so in this particular case, it all has to do with the size of the holes that are in this matrix. 
And so if you've got a small hole, a big molecule is going to have a lot harder time getting into that, so it's not going to get in, so it's not going to get held up as much as a small molecule would be. Ah, so as long as you've got, and sorry, to repeat the question. So wouldn't the small molecule go where the big molecules are going as well? Um, as long as you have enough of these beads, then everything is going to be interacting with them at some point as they go through your column. And so, yes, they all will go through, but the small ones are going to be held up. And as long as you have enough of the beads, then everything's got to go through something at some point. And so that's how you'll be separating your small molecules from your larger <coughs> molecules. Okay, so I just want to finish up talking about affinity chromatography. We'll look at the examples next time about this. This is how you do get your DNA binding proteins, et cetera, those that are present at very low concentrations in the cell and actually pull them out, that needle in the haystack process. And what you do is you take advantage of a very, very specific interaction. We talked already about DNA binding proteins. You put your specific DNA sequence onto one of these beads. You run everything through your column. The only thing that sticks to it is your DNA binding protein or whatever protein it is that you have an antibody to. You stuck the antibody to these beads, DNA various and sundry other ligands. If you have an enzyme, you know exactly what it binds to. You can put that onto these beads. I did this for three years when I was working at a large pharmaceutical company. I put the drug that our protein bound to on one of these things, purified our protein that way. What people do these days more and more is they will put a specific extra piece onto their protein, and we'll talk about that next week, how you do this with molecular biology techniques that then will bind to something very specific. Histidine tags bind to nickel. Flag tags bind to a specific antibody. Maltose binding protein binds to maltose. Um, and so these are ways you can purify things through affinity chromatography. So we'll look at some examples of this on Monday. On Wednesday, you get your chance to do feedback and tell me how horribly I did for this whole course. Um, and we'll also talk about DNA techniques.